from San Francisco, it's theCUBE. Covering Accenture Tech Vision 2020. Brought to you by Accenture. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here from theCUBE. We are high atop San Francisco at the Accenture Innovation Hub, 33rd floor of the Salesforce Tower. It's a beautiful night, but we're here for a very special occasion. It's the tech, it's the uh, tech Vision 2020 reveal, and we are happy to have the, the guy that runs the whole thing. He's going to re reveal on stage a little bit later, but we got him in advance. He's Paul Doherty, the Chief Technology and Information Officer for Accenture. Paul, great to see you as always. Great to see you, Jeff, too. It is a beautiful evening here looking out over the bay. <laughs> if only yeah. we could turn the cameras around, but sorry, we can't do that. Yeah. All right, so you've been at this now. The Tech Vision's been going on for 20 years, we heard earlier today. Yep. You've been involved for almost a decade. How has this thing evolved over that time? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, we've been doing the, the vision for 20 years and uh, what we've been trying to do is forecast what's happening with business and technology in a way that's actionable for executives. There's lots of trend forecasts and lists and things, but then it's, you know, if you just see a list of, you know, cloud or, you know, mobile's uh, going to be AI, really big. Mobile, <laughs> it doesn't really help you. We're trying to, you know, try to talk a little bit about the impact on business, the impact of the world and the decisions that you need to make. What's changed over that period of time is the, the just the breadth of the impact that technology is technology's having on, on people. So we, we focus at a lot of our visions on the impact on humans, on individuals, what's happening with technology. What, uh, the impact on business, uh, we'll, we can talk about that a little bit more, but business you know, is certainly you know, not the back office of companies anymore. It's not just the, front, you know, the back office and front office either. It's business is instrumental in the fabric of how every part of a company operates, their strategy, their operations, their products and services, et cetera. And that's really the trajectory we've seen as technology advances. We have this accelerating exponential increase in technology. The implications for executives and the stakes just get higher and higher. It's weird, there's so many, there's so many layers to this. One of the things we've talked about a lot is, is trust, and you guys talk yeah. about trust a lot, but, but what strikes me is kind of this dichotomy is on one hand, you know, do I trust the companies, right? Do I trust Mark Zuckerberg with my data to pick on him? He likes, gets picked on all the time. <laughs> That might be a question, but do I trust that Facebook is going to work? Absolutely. And so, you know, our, our reliance on the technology, our confidence in the technology, our, our just baseline assumption that this stuff is going to work is, is crazy high up to and including people taking naps in their Teslas, yeah, which right. are not autonomous yeah, not, not vehicles. Not autonomous vehicles. So it's this weird kind of split where it's definitely part of our lives, but it seems like kind of the consciousness is coming up of kind of the second order. What does this really mean to me? What does this really mean to my data? What are people actually doing with this stuff? And am I making a good value exchange? Well, that's the, uh, we talk in the vision this year about value versus values. And the question you're asking you're ask is getting right at that, the crux between value and values. You know, businesses have been using technology to drive value for a long time. That's how, you know, applying you know, different types of technology to the enterprise, whether it be you know, back to the mainframe days or uh, ERP packages, cloud computing, et cetera, artificial intelligence. So value is one thing we're talking about in the vision. How do you drive value using the technology? And one thing we found is there's a big gap. Only 10% of organizations are really getting full value from in the way they're applying technology. And those that are, are getting twice the revenue growth as, you know, as companies that are in. So that's one big gap in value. And then this values point is getting is really getting to be important, which is as technology can be deployed in ways that are more pervasive and impact you know, our experience, they're tracking our, our health details. Right, they right. know where we are, they know what we're doing, they're anticipating what we might do next. How does that impact the values? What, uh, how are the values of companies important in other ways? The values you have around sustainability and other things are increasingly important to you know, new generations of consumers and, and consumers who are thinking in new ways. So this value versus values is teeing up what we call uh, a tech clash, which is, isn't a tech lash, just a, against you know, people reacting against tech companies, as, as you said earlier. It's a tech clash, which is you know, the, um, the values that, that, that consumers, citizens, and people want, sometimes clashing with the, the, the value and the, the models that companies have been using right. to deliver their products and services. Well, it seems like, right, it's kind of the, what are you optimizing for game? And it yeah. seems like, right, it was such an extreme optimization towards profitability and shareholder value, and less, less necessarily employees, less necessarily customers, and certainly less in terms of the social impact. So that definitely, seems to be changing, but is it changing fast enough? Are people really grasping it? Well, I think the, there's, it's, the, the data is mixed on that. I think the, uh, there's a lot of mixed data on what do people really want. You know, so uh, uh, 
people you know, say they want you know, more privacy, they say they, they, they want uh, access and control their data, but they still use a lot of the services that that uh, may be inconsistent with you know, the values that, that, that they talk about and the values right. that come out in surveys. So, but that's changing. So consumers are getting more educated about how they want their data to be used. But the other thing that's happening is that companies are realizing that uh, it's a really a battle for experience. Experience is, is what, you know, is it, creating broader experiences, better experiences for consumers is what the battleground is. And experience, creating experience, whether you're a travel company or a bank or a, you know, a manufacturing company, whatever you might be, creating the experience requires data. And to get the data from an individual or another company, it takes trust. So this, this virtuous circle of experience, data, and trust is something that companies are realizing is essential to their competitive advantage going forward. And we say trust is the currency of the digital and post-digital world that we're moving into. Right. It's just how explicit is that trust, right? How explicit does it need to be? And as you said, that's, that's unclear. People can complain on one hand, but continue to use the services. So it seems to be a little bit uh, kind of squishy. It's a sliding scale. It's really a value exchange. They have to think about it. What, what's, what's the value exchange in the that and the value that an individual consumer places on their privacy versus free access to a service. That's the that's what's being worked out right now. Right. So I want to give you a take on another thing, which is exponential curves. And, and you've yeah. mentioned time and time again, right? The pace of change is only accelerating. Well, you've been saying that probably for 20 <laughs> years, yeah. right? So the curve's just getting steeper. How do you see that kind of playing out over time? Do, do will we eventually catch up? Is it just presume that this is kind of the new normal or you know how is this going to shake out because people aren't great at exponential curves it's just not really in our our dna yeah i think the uh but i think that's that's the world we're operating in now and i think uh the exponential potential is going to continue there, we don't see a slowdown in the exponential growth rates of technology so artificial intelligence we're at the early days cloud computing only about 20 percent enterprise adoption a lot more to go uh, new adoptions around the horizon, uh, things like you know, digital, central bank digital currencies that, we, uh, that we've done some research and announced some work on recently, quantum computing and uh, quantum cryptography for networking, et cetera. So the pace of innovation is, is going to accelerate. And, right. uh, and uh, the challenge for organizations is rationalizing that and deciding how to uh, incorporate that into their business, change their business, and change the way that they're serving their, you know, that they're, that they're uh, leveraging their workforce and you know, change the way that they're interacting with consumers. Right. And that's why what we're trying to address in the vision is provide a little bit of that roadmap into how you digest and adapt. There's also technology foundations of this. We talk about something in Accenture called living systems. You know, living systems as a new way of looking at the architecture of how you build your technology because you don't have static systems anymore. Your systems have to be living and biological and adapting to the new technology, adapting to the business, adapting to new data over time. So this concept of living systems is going to be really important to organization success going forward. But it's interesting because one, one of the topics is AI and me, and, and traditional AI was very kind of purpose-built. Um, for instance, you know, Google Photos, you know, can you find the cat, can I find yeah. the kids at the beach? But you're talking about, you know, kind of models where it, the AI can evolve and not necessarily be quite so data-centric around a specific application, but much more evolutionary and adaptable based yeah, on how things change. Yeah, I think that's the future of, of AI that we see. There's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, we've had a lot, you know, there's been a lot of success in applying AI today, and a lot of it's been based on uh, you know, supervised learning, deep learning techniques that require massive amounts of data. Uh, solving problems like machine vision requires massive amounts of data to do it right. And there's, uh, that'll continue. There'll continue to be problem sets that, that need large data. But what we're also what, you know, seeing is a lot of innovation in AI techniques around small data. And uh, we, we actually you know, did some research recently and we talked about this a little bit in our vision around, uh, around the future maybe being smaller data sets and stru more structured data and intelligence around structured data, common sense AI, and things that allow us to make breakthroughs in different ways. And that's, we look at AI and me, which is the trend around the workforce and how the workforce changes. It's those kinds of right. uh, adaptations that we think are going to be really important. So another one is, is robotics, robots in the wild. <laughs> and you made an interesting comment. Well, robots gone wild, robots, robots in the wild. In, well, maybe they'll go wild once they're in the wild, you never know, yeah. once they get autonomy. Not a lot of autonomy, that's probably why. Yeah. But it's kind of interesting, because you talked about you know robots being designed to help people do a better job, as opposed to carving out a specific function for the robot to do without a person. And it seems like that's a much easier route to go, to, you know, to set up a discrete thing that we can carve out and, and program the robot to do it. Probably early days of manufacturing and doing spot welding at cars, et cetera. Right. So is, is it a lot harder to do it, to have the, the robot operate with 
its human partner, if you will, and but are the benefits worth it? How do you kind of see that shaking out versus, ah, I can carve out one more function? Yeah, I think it's going to be a mix. I think there'll be, uh, but we see a lot of application of the ro robots with the, you know, paired with people in different ways. Cobots in manufacturing being a great example and something that's really taking off in manufacturing environments. And also, but also, you know, uh, robots of different forms that serve human needs. There's a lot of interesting things going on in healthcare right now. How can you support uh, autistic children or adults better using, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, human-like, you know, robots and agents that can interact in different ways. A lot of interesting things around Alzheimer's and dealing with cognitive uh, cognitive impairment and such using robots and robotics. So I think the, the future isn't, you know, there, there's a lot of robots in the wild in the form of like C-3PO's and R2-D2's and, and uh, those types of robots and we'll see some of those and those are being used widely in business today even in different contexts. But I think the, the, advan the interesting advance will be looking at robots that complement and augment and serve human needs more effectively. Right, right. And do people do a good enough job of getting some of the case studies like you just walked through of, you know, kind of the better use cases, the more humane use cases, the, 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 the kind of cool medical breakthroughs versus just continued optimization of getting me my Starbucks coupon when I walk <laughs> by out front. Yeah, I'm not Doesn't sure. Doesn't seem like get the pub, you know, they just don't get the pub, I yeah, don't yeah, think. Yeah. No, no, maybe not, although mixology <laughs> is another uh, function that robots are getting pretty good at. But the, uh, um, I think that's one thing we're trying to do is, is through uh, the effort we do with the vision as well as our tech for good work and other things is look at how we amplify and highlight some of the great work that, right. that is happening in those areas. So you've been doing it for, for a decade. What, what struck you this year as being a little bit different, a little bit unexpected, not necessarily you know, something you may have anticipated? I, th I think the, the thing that, I, that is maybe a tipping point that I see in this vision that didn't, I didn't anticipate is this idea that every company's really becoming a technology company. We said eight years ago, every business is be, is, will be a digital business, and that was, while ridiculed, or, you know, ridiculed by some at the time, that really came, came true, and every business and every industry really is becoming digital or has already become digital. But I think we might have gotten it slightly wrong. Digital was, a, was kind of a step, but every company is, is deploying technology in the way they serve their customers, in the way they build their products and services. Every product and service is becoming technology enabled. The ecosystem of technology providers is critical to companies in every industry. So every company is really becoming a technology company. They, it, every company needs to be as good as a digital native company at developing products and services and operating them. And so, it, so I think this idea of every company becoming a technology company, every CEO becoming a technology CEO and technology leader is something that, we're, you know, that I think will differentiate companies going right. forward as well. Well really, you know, good work you, Michael, and the team. It, it's, it's fun to come here every year because you guys do a little twist. Like you said, it's not, you know, cloud's going to be really big. You know, right. mobile's going to be really big. Yeah. But a little bit more thoughtful, a little bit more uh, deep, a little bit longer kind of thought cycles on these trends. Yeah, and I think the, uh, if, you, if, if you read through the vision, we're trying to present a, a complete story too. So it's, it is this, you know, uh, you know we the post-digital you know, people. But if you look under the vision, uh, the eye and experience is about serving your customers differently. Uh, the dile the uh, dilemma of smart machines and robots in the wild is about your new products and services in the post-digital environment powered by technology. AI and me is about the new workforce. Uh, and the age of, uh, or the uh, DNA, innovation DNA is about you know, driving continuous innovation in your organization, your culture, as you develop your business into the future. So it really is providing a, you know, a kind of a complete narrative on what we think the future looks like for executives. Right, good. Still more utopian than dystopian. I like more it. More utopian than dystopian, but you gotta, you gotta steer around the roadblocks. <laughs> All right, Paul, well thanks again, and, uh, and good luck tonight with the big presentation. Thanks, Jeff. All right, he's Paul, I'm Jeff, you're watching theCUBE. We're at the Accenture Innovation Reveal 2020, when we're going to know everything with the benefit of hindsight. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Oh.